Okay. Once again, it's good to see you this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with us to Judges, the sixth chapter, as we continue in our study this morning on the life and the, and the lessons of Gideon and what he experienced. So this is we're in Judges, the sixth chapter. We'll begin, we'll be reading verse 25 through 32. This morning, as we look at a recalibrated life of a re calibrated life. Now as we've been looking at Gideon, I hope you've realized something. I hope you've noticed something in the last few Sundays. And that is that when God begins to restore, and when God brings restoration to a, to, to a nation, to a people, to, to these things, God didn't start with Israel. He started with Gideon. Before he ever began to restore things around him, he restored something within him. And that's a pattern that we need to understand. That's a pattern that we need to embrace in our hearts and our life. Before you, when you come to the Lord and you ask God, God, would you restore my family? He's going to start with you. If you come to God and you say, Lord, restore my, my city, he's going to start with you. You come to God and say, Lord, God, restore my church, he's going to start with you. He always seems to start with us in bringing restoration to our lives and to our hearts. So this morning as we look at this, we see yet another stage of Gideon being restored. Yet another stage. And I love this simply because it's very personal to me. Because it tells me what it would take for me to be restored in the grace of God. And for me to be restored in the work and the purpose that he has for my life. So let's take a look this morning. At, 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 at Judges the 6th chapter and we'll begin reading at verse number 25. And it reads like this. Now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it. And build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement. And take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which ye shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men from among his servants and did as the Lord had said to him. But because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day, he did it by night. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, there was the altar of Baal torn down and the wooden image that was beside it was cut down. And the second bull was being offered on the altar which had been built. So they said to one another, who has done this thing? And when they had inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Then the men of the city said to Joash, bring out your son, that he may die because he has torn down the altar of Baal and because he has cut down the wooden image that was beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, would you plead for Baal? Would you save him? Let the one who pleaded for him be put to death this morning. I mean, by morning. If he is a god, let him plead for himself, because his altar has been torn down. Therefore, on that day, he called him Jeroboam, saying, Let Baal plead against him, because he has torn down his altar. This morning, I want to talk to you, with you just for a few minutes from a, this simple thought, a recalibrated life. A re calibrated life. Father, we are thankful for your grace. We're thankful for your mercy, Lord God. We're thankful for your mighty hand, Lord Jesus, that's been upon us this very day. We ask, Lord God, that this word become spirit and life to us, Lord Jesus, that you will anoint us, that you will enable us, that you would cause us to be everything that you have for us to be. Lord God, let restoration start in us, Lord God. Let it start in our lives, in our homes, Lord God. Oh, Lord Jesus, so that it may spill out to those that are around about us. In Jesus' glorious name we ask it. Amen and amen. I've always been fascinated by what is known as navigation. I love the fact that I can get on a plane in Chicago, break through the clouds, be in the, up in the air for two or three hours, come back down, and as soon as they come back through the clouds, amazingly, they're right where they're supposed to be. They're right where they, uh, there's no road signs, there's no landmarks. Once you're above the clouds, what do you see? Sky and clouds. And so for hours, they, they, they do this. 
Take, for instance, those that sail sailing vessels or ships on the, on the sea. They, they, by the time they leave the shore, most of the time all they see is water all around them. There's no landmarks. There's no road signs. There's no stop signs, which is probably a good thing for them out there in the middle of, of, this, of this ocean. And, they, and, and it'd be hard, it'd be easy to get turned around. It would be easy to get off course. It would be easy to get off track. And as I think about this thing, I, I begin to look into it a little bit and I begin to realize that the real magic behind it was not magic at all. It was all the calculations that navigators have to do. It's all the calculations that their instruments have to do. And, and these calculations, years ago, the, the, the sailors used to have to take these huge maps and lay them out before them. And they had to go outside and look at the stars and take measurements and go inside and draw up and, and make sure that the direction that they were going in, that the direction that that they were on would still t- bring them to the right place, would still be uh, ch- uh, charted on the course that they intended in, in their lives. And for this to be successful, whether it's in the airplane or whether it's in a ship or whatever, they had to constantly recalibrate where they are to where they needed to be. They had to constantly recalibrate their course. They had to constantly make adjustments. They had to constantly had to align themselves so that, so that they can make it to their destinations. You see, a, a pilot would tell you and so would a a ship's captain would tell you that for them, for, for them to get off just one degree would send them thousands of miles off course. It would send them to a destination that never, they never intended to. They had to be accurate. They had to be aligning themselves constantly to the course in which they're going to take. So this morning I'm here to tell you that in our spiritual life, in our walk with God, we need to realize that we are in constant need of recalibration. We're in constant need of making sure that we are on the proper track. We're in constant need of making sure that we are, are, are in the direction that we're going to, that we're in the, on the trajectory that we have. And what that means to us is that means that there must be constant adjustments, constant aligning to the, very, to the very course that we're on. What is that course? That course is the will of God. That course is God's desire for us. That course is what God wants and what God has for us. Now one thing you might realize if, if you found yourself out in the open sea where you couldn't see anything around you but water or you up in the sky where all there was was sky and clouds, you'd come to realize that it also allows you to realize if you're making progress toward where you're going. When you can't see that you're making progress, when it doesn't feel like you're making progress, when it doesn't seem like you're making progress, you can tell that as long as I stay on course, As long as I fly in this direction, as long as I sail on this trajectory, I will find myself where I need to be. Well, as children of God, we need to realize that sometimes we don't feel like we're making progress. Sometimes we don't feel like we're we're, we're, we're heading toward anything of any particular, that we don't feel like that we're accomplishing anything of, of any great value in our life. But if we constantly recalibrate our lives to the will of God in His way, we'll quickly find ourselves where we long to be. We'll quickly find ourselves on track and on course for what God has for our lives. And as I see Gideon here in this story, I see Gideon he already experienced making himself available to God. He had already experienced encountering God in the presence of God. But now God wanted to recalibrate his life. Now God wanted to realign his life to God's will. Gideon's life was not necessarily on track with God. You can look at, look at the first few verses. He, he, he was not really doing what God wanted him to do. He was not living in victory. He was not living in, 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 in the way that God intended for him to live. He needed a re- recalibrating of his life. And one of the first things that was said in our text, I really like that, is, he, is it said that, that and let me, let me read it exactly for you, it said that now it came to pass the same night. It's not like Gideon hadn't gone through a lot that day already. He had seen the angel of the Lord. He had seen, he had heard the call of God. He had, he had embraced and made himself available. He had turned around and encountered God. He had, he had offered a, a sacrifice up to God. And he had offered an offering up to God. But in the midst of it all, God says, I'm not through with you, Gideon. There's something more that you need to do. And I, don't go home. Don't climb in bed. He said, there's something that you need to do. He said, while it was still the very same day, still the very same night, it's time, Gideon, for you to experience a recalibration in your heart. 
and in your life. You see, God desires for us not merely to be recipients of God's restoration, but he desires to us to be conduits of his restoration. He desires for us to be instruments that he can use, not only to bring restoration to your life, to your family, to your, to, to your situation, but to bring restoration to everyone that is around about you. But there is a key, a key that unlocks this recalibration. It's an old-fashioned term. You've already heard it this morning, but it's not a term that you hear often in our modern-day churches, and it is the word surrender. When we begin to surrender to God in, in many ways, when we begin to surrender to God's will, all of a sudden we find ourselves in that place where God can recalibrate our heart. Look at Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. This is Paul telling us how we can be recalibrated, how we can, can surrender to what God's will is in our heart and our life. Notice what it said. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He's saying you want to align yourself to where you need to be. That's what it is. The good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He said, how do you do that? By offering yourself up as a living sacrifice. I love the fact that he uses the phrase living. He didn't say, don't put a cold, dead sacrifice on the altar. God doesn't want that. What God wants is he wants somebody that's a sacrifice every day. He wants a sacrifice that is living. He wants a sacrifice that is alive. He wants a sacrifice that is serving him. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And yes, even on Sunday. He wants, he wants us to, to, to be that kind of believer that, so that we might prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now all my life I've heard people brag, oh if I had to I'd give my life to the Lord. I would give my life up. I would die for him. And, and, and I, all the while not to be critical but sometimes I sit back saying you won't even live for him. What makes you think you're going to die? For him when it comes down to it. You see your level of devotion is not measured by what you do at the end of your life. Your measure of devotion is not, men, uh, not, not measured by, by what you do uh, in, in, in a moment of a passion or a moment of emotion. But it is measured by how you live your life. How you walk your life. And he says, hey, Paul said, if we do this, we have to surrender our bodies to God. That, that he can, and that means our lives to God. He said we've got to surrender our thinking to God. By the renewing of our minds. He said, why do you do that? So that you can be back on track. Why do you do that? So that you can be living in God's perfect and God's acceptable and God's good will for your heart and for your life. And so as we look at what Gideon experiences here, we notice a few things about what it means to recalibrate our lives. We notice what it means to recalibrate our existence so that it would fit into what God has for our hearts. First of all, I want you to notice, the first thing I want you to realize about this recalibration is that we must, first of all, recalibrate our home. God turned around and the first thing that he did was sent Gideon back home. God realized something that revival for the church begins in our homes. Revival for our families begins at home. Revival for even for our own hearts begins at home. He was saying to Gideon, he said, Gideon, I want you to get your house in order. Gideon, I want you to make sure that, that your house is, is, is given to me and make sure that your house is devoted to me. Notice what it said in verse number 25 here. Now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it. He sends Gideon back home to deal with some things in his own household, to deal with some things in his own families. Let me tell you, it's time, church, that we awaken to the realization that there has been some long-established idols that we need to deal with. There's some long-established idols that, you know, maybe... 
Maybe, the, maybe you don't, we don't show people on Sunday. Maybe, we don't, maybe people don't see or talk about in our families or, or our lives. But they overshadow our families. And, and, they, and we need to clearly do what Gideon said and say, Today, Lord, I give my house back to you. Today, Lord, I give my family back to you. Today, Lord, I establish within my heart and my home that as for me and my household, we shall serve the Lord. So he begins to d- declare this. It begins to show this in, in, in our life. You see, uh, it becomes really clear to me. When I looked at the response that the men of the city had toward what Gideon had done, it became clear to me that this shrine that Gideon tore down was not just his father's shrine. That, over, that this was a huge shrine. You're going to see later how this was a massive shrine. And it seemed that, his, that Gideon's father <coughs> was merely a caretaker of a community shrine. He was a caretaker of something that belonged not only to him, but to everyone else around about him. He had allowed this thing to seep into his life. He had allowed this thing to become a part of his everyday existence uh, before him. And there, oftentimes, if we're not careful, we allow, things to, we allow to accommodate things in our lives that after a while begins to take hold of our lives and we need to step back and say, is God pleased with my, my life? Is God pleased with the things that I am accommodating? Is God pleased with the idols that I may have set up before him? Those idols are things that we devote our hearts to, that we devote our mind to, that we devote our time and our efforts and our money to. Is there areas in our lives that we need to say, Lord God, help recalibrate my home. Help recalibrate my household according to your will. But you see this, I understand something. This is a monumental task. It was a monumental task for Gideon. Gideon went out and recruited how many men? Ten. He recruited 10 men. He had how many bulls? Two. He had two men and and 10 bulls. Let me tell you, this was not a small task for Gideon to do. They would go and they would tear down this this idol, this huge idol. I think it's ironic that the the, the idol for Baal was a bull and the bull was going to pull it down. I like like that. And then he turned around and he took the wooden Asherah pole that they worshipped and he broke that down and he broke, broke that apart. But it took 10 men and two bulls to accomplish that task. And I I understand that when it comes to our household, when it comes to our families, that sometimes we may become intimidated by what we're facing. Sometimes it may become overwhelming by what we're having to go through. Sometimes, But let me tell you, you need to to say, Lord God, I'm going to be obedient to you. And if it requires recruiting some prayer warriors, recruit some prayer warriors. If it requires calling on friends and brothers and sisters that you trust and say, will you help me pray? I've got a lost loved one. Will you help me pray? I want God to be back in my home and back in my life and back in my family. It's time, church, that here in Freeport that we be known as a people who has recalibrated our home to be a place where God belongs in our life. And then secondly, I want you to notice that we need to recalibrate our influences. You see, I don't think, I don't think that, that Gideon's father woke up one morning thinking, I got a great idea. I'm just going to build a shrine to a, to a, to a, to a foreign god. I, think, I didn't think he'd come up with this all in, in his own. I believe over time, more and more people said, well, to his father, why don't you help us here? We need your help here just kind of cleaning up around this shrine. Oh, after a while, the more involved he got, the more entangled he got until, until the influences of, the, of his culture and the influences of the world around about him begin to entangle him in something that he never became wished to be entangled with. We must realign our influences. What is influencing you? What is, conv- what, what is teaching you? What is a voice in your life? What is a voice in your heart? What is a voice that you've given into your, into your family? We've got to stop and say, Lord God, help me to recalibrate the influences in my life. We've got to say, Lord God, I am not of this world, so Lord, I am not to be influenced by the culture in which I live in. Lord God, I am not to be influenced by what people think, say, do. I am to be influenced by what your word has in in my life. So we need to recalibrate the influences of our life. Now we know this when we're raising kids, don't we? Watch out who you hang out with. Because you're going to act like them, you're going to talk like them. But sometimes we need to look in the mirror and say, watch out who you hang out with. Watch out who you listen to. 
Watch out what you watch. Watch out what you read. Watch out what you allow to be influences in your life. He, uh, Gideon tore that. And I like Gideon's dad's response. He seemed upset, didn't he? No. Gideon's dad seemed almost relieved that this was happened. He almost relieved that his son had the courage to confront something that he didn't have the courage to confront in his life. And he was standing in defense of Gideon on this day and on this offense. We need to take a good hard look at the influences in our lives and say, Lord God, what is influencing me? I want you to be the influence of my heart. I want you to be the influence of my life. I want to walk according to what your word has to say and what you have for my life. So we need to recalibrate our influences. We also need to recalibrate our purpose. We need to be intentional about obeying God. We need to be intentional about what... And nobody's a Christian by accident. Let me tell you that. Nobody grows in Christ by accident. Nobody, nobody encounters God by accident in their, in their life. Notice what it's, the verse said in verse 27. So Gideon took ten men from among his servants and did as the Lord had said. I like that. To him, it said to him, but because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much... To do it by day, he did it by night. Gideon's, uh, Gideon's uh, purpose, Gideon's purpose was to live intentionally. He was to live intentionally. He, he, would, he would tear down. The, he, he, I like it. He was, you could tell he's a man of systems because he, he recruited 10 men. He knew how many men it would take to deal with this massive shrine to Baal and to tear down. And he, he, he knew that the bulls were not just there for a sacrifice, that the bulls was there to help to throw ropes around that old idol and to pull it to the ground and to snap off that pole that had, that had been a, a set up there. You see, he, he was intentional about his obedience to God. He was intentional about what he was going to do. He was intentional about serving God. We need to determine in my heart and in my mind that I will do as the Lord has said for me to do. That I will be intentional in the life that I live. That I will be intentional in all that I do for him. Oh, may we be marked by our obedience. May we be marked as faithful servants. Because when I stand before God, he's not going to ask me, how much money I had in the bank. He's not going to ask me what kind of house I owned or what kind of car I drove. But he's going to, hopefully I'll hear these glorious words. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. You see, he, he puts value in our faithfulness. He puts value in our doing what he's called us to do. So we need to realize that we need to realign, constantly realign our purpose before God. We also need to recalibrate our fears or our, and our flaws. Notice what it said in verse number 27. I like, I, I, like, I like this. It says, So Gideon took ten men from among his servants and did as the Lord had said to him, but because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day, he did it by night. Now, there's a lot of preachers that give Gideon a hard time because of the fear that was in Gideon's heart. Gideon never seemed to really get over fear. He seemed to take it through it out the entirety of the story. He needed reassurances again and again and again. But let me tell you what courage is. Courage is not the lack of fear. Anybody that's ever had to face something like a, a battle scene or, or a war will tell you, that courage is not that you don't have any fear. Courage is when you don't let fear stop you. It's when you don't let fear to, uh, to, uh, short circuit what God wants for your life. Gideon was a man that had fear, but he said, I declare that, Lord God, even my fears I'm going to give to you. Even my frustrations I'm going to give to you. Even my insecurities I'm going to give to you. And that's, that's where, where, where with Gideon, his flaw was fear. With us, we've got all kinds of flaws. We've got all kinds of areas in our life. We're like, well, God can't use me because of this. God can't use me because of that. God can't use me because of any of these things. I'm here to declare to you on the authority of the Word of God that God even wants your flaws. God even wants those weaknesses in your life. God even wants those areas that you might be insecure about and unsure about. God wants you to recalibrate them according to His will and His way. Say, Lord, I might not do it as good as somebody else might do it, but I'm going to still serve you. 
I might not be as talented as somebody else, but Lord God, I'm going to use what little abilities and little talents that I have for you. Lord God, I want to recalibrate my fears. I want to recalibrate my flaws so that I may truly be obedient to you so that I may know that good and perfect and acceptable will of God in my life. You see, he, he also wants to recalibrate our reputation. You see, come morning, something happened. A mob began to form. The men of the city, that's why this tells me that this was more than just, than just uh, Joe Ash's uh, uh, idol. The men of the city raised up and they became irate. As a matter of fact, they were so angry that they say the, the penalty for this needs to be death. We need the head of Gideon. We need him dead right now. We need him destroyed right now. And all, here came a dad. Don't you like it when your dad steps up and he says something profound and wise and, 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 and saves, saves you from, from trouble? It was, here comes dad. Dad comes up and he says, why do you need to defend a God like Baal? Is Baal not strong enough to, to defend himself? Is Baal not strong enough to speak for himself? He said, let anyone that defends Baal die. He said, that's the one that needs to die because Baal, if he's truly the God that you worship, if he's truly the God that you serve, let him step forward. Let him defend himself. You see, I believe that Joash understood something. Baal wasn't stepping forth. Baal wasn't doing it because Baal was a fake God. Baal was a false God. But something happened that very day. And that is that, G that Gideon, while he wasn't even around, got a brand new reputation. He got a brand new name in the middle of it. And I like this name. If, if, uh, let's, let's look at that verse. Verse 32. Therefore, on that day, he called, he, he called him Jeroboam, saying, let Baal plead against him because he was torn, he had torn down his uh, altar. I like that. He was called Jeroboam. Not only was he called Jeroboam by the people in that area, but in, in the word of God, as we, we look, he, he's continually called Jeroboam. He's, and what Jeroboam means is let Baal contend. In other words, an enemy of Baal. Oh, I like that. Oh, Gideon was, oh, I mean, Gideon all of a sudden went from being a weak, frail person on the backside of nowhere. But because of his obedience, he had a reputation as a warrior against a god. A warrior against Baal himself. Oh, that we would have that reputation in Freeport. That we would be a threat to the very kingdom of darkness. That we would be one... That people say, oh, you don't mess with them. Oh, because, oh, they, their God is stronger than, than our gods. Their God is stronger than our culture. Their God is stronger than, than, than our world. Oh, that our reputation would be realigned to him. That our reputation would be what he has for our hearts. What he has for our lives. I want a new name. How about you? I want a testimony that would mock Satan as I walk into the room. I want to be a threat to hell. I want to be a threat to the demonic. I want to be a threat to, 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 to evil. I want to be a threat to those things. Why? Because I want my life realigned, recalibrated to the perfect and the ideal will of God in my life. And I know you want it too. I know you, I know you desire it too. And I know you want to say, Derek, I want my life recalibrated. Oh, to be, I want my home recalibrated. Oh, I want my reputation recalibrated. I want my flaws and my fears re recalibrated. I want my purpose and, of, of, of living to be recalibrated. I want my life recalibrated for God. We got one shot. One shot. Maybe 70, 80, 90 years. Maybe if you're blessed, maybe you, I hope all of you live to be over 100 years old. Some of you said, don't, don't wish that, on, don't want, want that on us, brother. But I do believe that we have one shot and we can live it to the full for God or we can waste it for this world. We can waste it on the place. How many, how many people is going to stand before God and say, Lord, I was successful down there, but I'm a failure here. Why? Because my life was not recalibrated to your will and to, to your way. You can be a success where you are. You can, you, can be, you can be an influence right where you are. I'm not talking about, we don't all have to quit and join seminary. We don't have to do that. But I mean that we need to make sure constantly, Lord God, we want our life recalibrated to you. Would you stand with us?
just like that ship on the, on the, on the midst of the sea. That they look to the front, the back, to the sides, and it all looks the same. Sea as far as they could see. Sky. Didn't feel like they're making much progress, but they understood something. Their course had been charted for them. Somebody had laid out a plan for them. And because of that, all they had to do was keep realigning their lives to that plan. God has a plan. And all it requires from us is what Paul said, just to surrender. And they say, Lord, I surrender my life. I surrender my thinking to be what you would have for me to be. To Lord God, give it to you. Because I want nothing less than the, the good and the perfect and the acceptable will of God in my heart and in my life. This, this morning, I want, to give you, I want to give you an opportunity. I want to give you an opportunity to do an old-fashioned thing, and that's called surrender. To say, Lord God, I want to give you my life, the entirety of my life. Oh, I got some things planned, though, Derek. What you have planned is nothing in comparison to what God has planned uh, in your life. Oh, Derek, I don't know if I can. Let me tell you, if you surrender to God, he will align your life according to his purposes, his plan. If you're in this place and you would say, yes, Derek, I, I want to surrender. I want to surrender to God. Just, just do it. A, a, here's the international sign of surrender right here. Is when we throw up both hands in the battlefield or in the kingdom of God. And if you say, Lord, I want to surrender before you this day. I was born for a reason. I was born for a purpose, God. I was born, Lord God, oh Lord Jesus, to make a difference in my family, to make a difference in my children's life, to make a ch difference in my neighborhood, to make a difference in my place of work. Lord, here I am. I surrender. Oh, Father, we look to you, Lord God. You see our hearts, God. You see, Lord Jesus, our desire. Our desire is to surrender to you, Lord God. Our desire is to say yes, Lord, to, to recalibrating our home, recalibrating our reputation, Lord God, recalibrating, Lord God, our purpose in every measure, in every way, Lord God. We want to give an offer up to you, ourselves as a living sacrifice unto you, Lord God. Ourselves, Lord Jesus, we want to, we want to present ourselves to you, Lord God, and not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds, Lord God, that we might prove that, prove that, Lord, which is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Here we are, Lord Jesus. Use us. Here we are, Lord Jesus. Speak through us at work, God. Use us, Lord God, in ways, Lord, that we can, and we can hardly fathom or hardly imagine, Lord God, so that we may know restoration for ourselves and that we might know restoration in our cities, God. That we might know restorations around us, Lord God. That we may be bringers of life and light to our neighbors, Lord God, and to our friends, Lord God. Restore us this day. Restore Freeport, Lord God, for your glory and your praise, Lord God. And, and do it through us first, Lord God. And move through us first, Lord God. And we'll give you the praise and we'll give you the glory for it all in Jesus glorious name we ask it amen and amen thank you for coming this morning don't you let this day get away from you without enjoying this 50 degree temperature okay